How does a revolutionary regime, once in power, negotiate with its sworn mortal enemies? This was the problem that confronted the Hungarian Soviet Republic in 1919. This regime, inspired by Lenin's triumph in Soviet Russia and led by the Hungarian revolutionary Béla Kun, very much wanted to be recognized by the Allies who had won the First World War and who were negotiating in Paris to craft a post-war world order through the Versailles Treaty and other treaties. But these capitalist negotiators and leaders were their ideological foes. How to impress and awe them? The answer Soviet Hungary came up with, recorded by the British negotiator Harold Nicholson in his memoirs, produced one of the most bizarre moments in diplomatic history. Let's intrude into that moment. It's April 1919, and we are in Budapest. But the city is not its usual glorious, sparkling, proud, beautiful self. Instead, this is a dreary, rainy city, gray and oppressed by defeat, as Hungary has ended up on the losing side of the First World War. People staring at the newly arrived British representatives seem yellow with malnutrition and beset with universal sadness and shabbiness. The British negotiating team has arrived to discuss a ceasefire between Soviet Hungary and encroaching Romanian forces. But the real purpose, Nicholson says, is to see whether Béla Kun is worth using as a vehicle for getting into touch with Moscow. Nicholson finds the task distasteful, but seeing Bolshevism up close is a riveting prospect. To keep their distance, the British team stay in their train wagon instead of being housed at the luxurious Hotel Hungaria, which Béla Kun had prepared for their stay. They meet Béla Kun himself, who proves in person to be an unimpressive figure. He's in his 30s, short, with a shaved head and a sulky, suspicious, and frightened expression. Later, as Nicholson is driven around Budapest, his minders suddenly announce that Kuhn wants them to take tea at the Hotel Ungaria. At first, the British want to refuse, but the minders look so scared that they agree for their sakes. As they step into this world-class hotel, Nicholson says, It is clear from the moment that we enter that it is a put-up job, carefully staged to impress us. It has all been arranged to show us that even under Bolshevism, Budapest remains the gayest city in Central Europe. People sit at dainty tables, sipping lemonade or coffee as Hungarian music plays in the background. But then, slowly, Nicholson notices odd things. There are red guards stationed at all the doors with fixed bayonets. And strangest of all, the people sitting at the tables are not talking with one another, but sit absolutely silent. In fact, this is a hostage situation. Nicholson says, if one looks up suddenly, one catches countless frightened eyes, and at the back of those eyes, a mutely passionate appeal. Then the eyes flick away towards the lemonade, and the ghastly silence continues. It's quite clear that all these huddled, silent people have been let out of prison for the afternoon in order to fill the foyer of the Hungaria. I shudder and feel cold. We leave as soon as possible. Silent eyes search us out as we go. Now, nothing came of this British mission, and the Hungarian communists must have been disappointed. In a few months, their regime, the first such outside the Russian Empire, collapsed. But the hopes they had endured. Until roughly 1923, the new communist regime in Moscow and its allies worldwide continued to breathlessly await the outbreak of world revolution, for which Lenin's Bolsheviks believed they had provided the spark. It was a complicated game of playing for time, sometimes fighting, sometimes negotiating, but always expecting revolution. In essence, the Bolsheviks sought a red bridge to world revolution, whether through war, subversion, diplomacy, or a complicated combination of all of these. When the First World War ended with the armistice on November 11, 1918, the Red Army was set on the move. Soviet forces invaded the newly independent Baltic states and Poland and Ukraine, stretching to link up with an expected revolt in Germany. 
These efforts continued and merged with the ongoing Russian Civil War, that confused series of clashes between Lenin's Bolsheviks and different sets of opponents. These opponents included Russian monarchists, socialist revolutionaries, anarchists, peasant partisans, and foreigners, some 200,000 soldiers from Britain, France, Japan, and the United States, and the Czech Legion. Yet, by November 1920, the Bolsheviks had survived and had beaten their enemies. The white forces and their foreign allies lacked clear goals or organization, and they never crafted a message that could appeal broadly to the masses. By contrast, from their embattled stronghold in Moscow, the Bolsheviks did have a plan. That plan was to hold out and then spread worldwide revolution. Created and perfected by Leon Trotsky, the Commissar for War, the Red Army proved the vital instrument for victory. On the road to power, Bolshevik agitators had encouraged the dissolution of military discipline and disaffection in the ranks as a way of undermining the provisional government. But once they were in power, they restored harsh discipline. This is a typical move. First, the political order is deconstructed, and then in a reversal, a new order is imposed. At first, the Bolsheviks knew they could rely on their Red Guards and Latvian riflemen regiments, but these would not be enough. The order to form the Mass Army was given in January of 1918. But because of a shortage of trained experts, officers included professional soldiers who had earlier served the Tsar. Special political commissars were added alongside them to keep an eye on these technical specialists. Trotsky solved logistical and supply nightmares and rallied the troops with fiery speeches as he swooped in to visit them on his armored train, in which he covered over 65,000 miles. The Red Army grew to 5 million by the end of the Civil War. With its help, the state pursued a ruthless extractive economic policy named War Communism, which left a very deep stamp on their government. They centralized governmental control even more, nationalizing factories and requisitioning food from farmers to feed the cities and the armies. To spread the message of global revolution, the Bolsheviks sponsored an entire institution tasked with that goal, their newly organized Third International, or the Comintern, which was short for Communist International. Lenin had been calling for a new international since the war itself to gather from around the world all the real socialists from his perspective, to expel the opportunists and revisionists and deviationists of the failed Second International and to get the job done. Now, in the late winter of 1919, Lenin urged that this be made a reality to forestall any revival of the discredited Second International. The founding Congress of the Third International started on March 2nd, 1919 in Moscow, and the Comintern would be based there. A year previous, the capital had been moved from Petrograd to the old city of Moscow set more deeply and securely in Russian territory. Now the Kremlin fortress had again become the center of power, and that is where the Third International met. This organization was in some ways a, a company to export revolution. By spreading propaganda and offering help to other communist parties springing up around the world. The fiction was that it was an independent, private organization. At first, its official language was German, the language of Marx, which was only replaced with Russian in 1924. The founding meeting began with a tribute to dead comrades such as Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Liebknecht, who had been killed in Berlin two months before. At first, the Comintern was small, mostly a gathering of Russians with a sprinkling of non-Russian communists. But by the Second Congress the year after, delegates from 37 countries attended. At that meeting in Moscow in 1920, Lenin dictated 21 points as conditions for a party to be admitted to membership in the new common turn. Their core was following the lead of the victorious Bolsheviks in breaking completely with reformist socialists, following the formula of democratic centralism and the party line, 
and planning for the phase of worldwide civil war. Grigory Zinoviev was made the chairman of the Comintern, and working with him were Karl Radek and Viktor Serge. Radek was the Polish Jewish Bolshevik who had been with Lenin on that sealed train back to Russia, and who along the way had bought Lenin the pants that he apparently wore for much of 1917. Radek was the classic internationalist. He spoke Polish, Russian, German, and French, all in his idiosyncratic way, and was a dazzling and witty journalist and conversationalist. He was called half professor, half bandit. He'd been thrown out of the Polish party and the, AS the SPD in Germany. He had a huge talent for antagonizing people. At the start of 1919, he had been sent to Berlin by the Bolsheviks to help organize the German Communist Party with his old comrade Rosa Luxemburg. And he was there during the Spartacus uprising in January 1919. And after the revolt was crushed, he was arrested in February. Only at the end of 1919 was he released to return to Moscow, and then he got to work in the Comintern. The other employee of the Comintern I mentioned was Viktor Serge. We'll follow him in the evolution of the communist movement and Soviet state, because like Radek, although he's definitely not famous today, he was a striking and insightful character. And he also embodies a political problem. What would lead a self-professed anarchist to become a Bolshevik? Why and how would someone with a conviction that state power corrupts and enslaves join the centralizers of state power? Born in Belgium to Russian exile parents, Serge came to Soviet Russia in 1919. In his book, Memoirs of a Revolutionary, he relates how he lived through the same dilemma again and again as he worked for the communist regime. He condemned the Cheka, its arbitrary arrests. He condemned the emerging privileged nomenclatura of the party elite with privileges of its own and other abuses, but he did not break with Lenin and the Bolsheviks. Instead, he stuck with his role, speaking of doing a double duty, to guard against the external enemies of the revolution, but to remain within the party to combat abuses within. He would intervene, sometimes successfully, sometimes not for those who were about to be executed. He would argue in debates against dictatorial rule and against the suppression of free speech, but then he would submit to party discipline all the same. He spoke of the current atmosphere of terror as intolerable inhumanity, but then he tolerated it by remaining within the regime. Speaking of the suppression of non-Bolsheviks, Serge observed, I was exceptionally well-placed to follow the progress of this evil. Note that verb, to follow, not to oppose, to quell, to combat, to protest. The role of being the heroic inner conscience within the regime is actually fraught with problems, and maybe another variety of what the political philosopher Hannah Arendt famously called the banality of evil. So how could that pose and self-concept be sustained over the long term. In each case for Serge, by this mechanism. In spite of it all, history would vindicate the Bolsheviks. As Serge concluded, Bolshevism was in my eyes tremendously and visibly right. It marked a new point of departure in history, and there were no alternatives from Serge's perspective. Many ardent radicals flocked to the common turn, other foreign communists became prominent in this movement, including the American writer John Reed. His journalistic account of the Bolshevik seizure of power in Red October was entitled Ten Days That Shook the World, and then was the basis for the Eisenstein film that mythologized the coup. Reed was from Portland, Oregon, from a well-to-do background. But after Harvard, he gravitated towards socialist movements. Sent to Europe as a war reporter, he was thrilled by what he saw in Russia and crossed over from reporting to partisan support. Back home, he was among the founding group of American communists, and he returned to Russia for a common turn Congress. There he fell ill and died in October of 1920 and was buried in a tomb set into the wall of the Kremlin, the so-called Kremlin Necropolis, or City of the Dead, as an honored foreign communist. 
the Comintern united and encouraged new communist parties, recruiting from among radical socialists who split from their earlier comrades in a now heightened form of factionalism. Such parties were already being formed in Germany, France, and the United States. The Chinese Communist Party was organized in 1921. In Moscow, Sun Yat-sen University was founded for Chinese youth, with Karl Radek as provost. Radek described this as being the equivalent of Christian missionary schools, except for Marxism. The later Vietnamese leader, Ho Chi Minh, was a founding member of the French Communist Party and then came to Moscow to work in the Comintern. A truly remarkable Japanese man by the name of Sen Katayama, who had lived for years in the United States and studied in Tennessee, helped to found Japan's Communist Party in 1922. Later, Katayama moved to Moscow and died there in 1933. Among those who carried Katayama's coffin to its resting place in the wall of the Kremlin was Joseph Stalin. Through front organizations, the Comintern sought not only active agents, but also sympathizers in Russian paputniki, fellow travelers, to aid the communist cause. The Comintern sent agents with money and advice and expected to have its orders followed. From the moment of its founding, in the late winter of 1919, those involved in the Comintern were deliriously hopeful. In fact, in the very first issue of its journal, entitled Communist International, in April 1919, Chairman Zinoviev announced, As we write these lines, the Third International already has as its main foundation three Soviet republics in Russia, Hungary, and Bavaria. But nobody will be surprised if, when these lines come to be printed, we have not three, but six or even more Soviet republics. Old Europe is rushing toward revolution at breakneck speed. In a 12-month, we shall already have begun to forget that there ever was a struggle for communism in Europe, for in a year, the whole of Europe will be communist. Now, as it turned out, Soviet Hungary lasted for only four months. Soviet Bavaria for only three weeks. So let's examine these instructive failures and their lessons. As I mentioned, Hungary had been among the defeated powers of the First World War. And in the aftermath, its territory was radically truncated, facing occupation by French forces, Romanians, and Czechs. Hungarians reacted with fury, and the nationalist slogan was to be heard in the streets, no, no, never. No mainstream party in Hungary was willing to continue governing, so a power vacuum emerged. In dire straits, the socialists agreed to a fusion with the new Hungarian Communist Party, whose leader, Béla Kuhn, was hauled right from jail to national office. Kuhn was Hungarian Jewish by origin, from Transylvania, and had been a not very successful journalist and trade union official before the war. During the First World War, he had been drafted into the Austro-Hungarian army and was captured by the Russians in 1916. As a prisoner of war, he joined the Russian Bolsheviks and got to know Lenin, who dispatched him to his native country to agitate. Kuhn suggested to Hungarians that alliance with and help from Soviet Russia could be their salvation. And even nationalist Hungarians could support the new state. Coming to power on March 21, 1919, the new regime pushed back the foreign armies and undertook quick radical reforms in economics and culture. Instead of trying to co-opt the peasantry as Lenin had done, Kuhn's government proceeded immediately to collectivization. Noble estates were nationalized rather than being distributed to poor farmers who became alienated from the new government in Budapest. Instead of the land reform they had hoped for and private farms for themselves, they now faced the prospect of farming for the state. Food supply broke down. The government nationalized banks, safety deposit boxes and their contents, apartment buildings, and all branches of trade. Culture and social life were also to be revolutionized, starting with a ban on alcohol. Titles were abolished, which shocked an older generation of Hungarians. One countess is said to have fainted when a bus conductor addressed her as citizeness. Georg Lukács, the philosopher, was commissar for education and culture. 
the Commissar of the Interior and Commissar of War, Tibor Shamleli, established a repressive apparatus domestically. Newspapers were shut down, critics of the regime arrested, and brutal gangs of regime supporters who called themselves Lenin boys terrorized the populace. But food shortages, inflation, and rampant corruption were so bad that even government officials criticized their own regime. All these took their toll. And when Romanian and Czech armies moved on the capital of Budapest again, the regime toppled after only 133 days, collapsing in early August 1919. Kuhn and his associates fled. Given his experience, he was invited to join the co-workers of the Comintern in Moscow. In Hungary itself, a repressive national conservative regime took power and enacted counter-revolutionary or white terror of its own, taking an estimated 5,000 lives. Its leader was Admiral Miklos Horthy, who ruled as regent. To the west, in southern Germany, the Hungarian uprising inspired radicals in Munich, in Bavaria. That part of defeated Germany had also been a swirl with turmoil and violence. With the end of the war, seven centuries of Wittelsbach royal family rule came crashing down. A new socialist republic was declared by Kurt Eisner, but he was assassinated by a radical nationalist student. In the aftermath, Bavaria was declared to be a Soviet republic. The new rulers included anarchists, writers, and poets. Locals nicknamed it the regime of the coffee house anarchists. The new regime only had enough time to promise the end of capitalism through the printing of money. Its minister for foreign affairs demanded that Switzerland turn over locomotives to the new state. And when Switzerland refused, he declared war on the Swiss. These men, however, were soon replaced by more serious and determined revolutionaries, led by Max Levin, an adherent of Lenin, who announced that the new Bavaria would be a springboard to revolution throughout Europe. But the central government in Berlin had had enough, and it sent in the brutal Freikorps mercenaries, who had earlier crushed the Spartacus uprising and murdered Rosa Luxemburg. Blood flowed in the streets of Munich in May 1919, with a shooting of hostages and prisoners on both sides. The Freikorps killing spree was horrific. Incidentally, an unknown German soldier named Adolf Hitler was on the scene in Bavaria, observing how to mobilize masses and planning for the future. Though Soviet Hungary and then Soviet Bavaria went down to defeat, two important points may be made about them. First, some opponents of the regimes used the Jewish family origins of some prominent revolutionaries to assert a concept of Judeo-Bolshevism the claim that Jews and communism were one and the same. This was false and a slander, ignoring the fact that these same revolutionaries had deliberately rejected the traditions of their ancestry or any religious faith, and the fact that the class enemies they targeted, the bourgeoisie, also included many Jews. Nonetheless, this false equivalency would often be asserted and later became a core belief of the Nazis. The second point has to do with questions of nationalism. Strangely enough, Béla Kuhn's Soviet Hungary actually sold itself to Hungarian nationalists as the one true defender of national sovereignty and national interests and won some support on this score. Here we see the beginnings of a longer and more convoluted relationship between communists in power and nationalism as a theme. If the failed attempts at Sovietizing Hungary and Bavaria were disappointing, remaining Bolshevik hopes were raised and then dashed in the Soviet-Polish War of 1920. In that war, the Red Army hoped to advance westwards and link up with Germany. That meant conflict with an expansive Poland, which had just regained its independence after the First World War. Russian Bolsheviks assumed that Polish peasants and workers would rise up to support the Red Army, to overthrow rich Polish landlords and owners. Indeed, by the summer of 1920, the Red Army was on the Vistula River, but was then held back by Polish forces in front of Warsaw in a remarkable popular and nationalist mobilization. This is remembered by Poles as the miracle on the Vistula. The Poles counterattacked and drove the Red Army back eastwards. 
After a ceasefire in the fall, a peace treaty followed in 1921. The receding of hopes for revolution in the West to link up with was a bitter realization for Lenin. The bitterness grew with a mutiny by Soviet sailors at the Kronstadt garrison outside Petrograd. Earlier, the most ardent supporters of Lenin, these sailors revolted in February 1921 against the one-party rule of Lenin. The sailors demanded that civil liberties be restored and that a new constituent assembly be elected for the country. Trotsky directed the attack that crushed them, and the leaders were shot, their followers imprisoned in camps. Kronstadt now became synonymous with a huge reverse and with disillusionment, given that the revolutionaries were suppressing their own. In the lead-up to Red October, it had been these sailors from Kronstadt who had demanded a radical seizure of power. And it had been Trotsky who had calmed them down, calling them the pride and glory of the revolution. Now the same Trotsky was their butcher. Lenin reacted to this crisis and the dire economic situation in the country with another strategic retreat, resembling the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk to gain breathing space. Even as the Kronstadt revolt was being put down, a new economic policy, or NEP, was announced, eliminating requisitions and allowing some free enterprise on a small scale, while the government still retained control of heavy industry as a so-called commanding heights of the economy. This temporary measure allowed for a surprising level of recovery, but it stirred worries among communists. A final measure, which acknowledged that the hoped-for international revolution was delayed, was paradoxically the very founding of the USSR. The failure to establish a red bridge meant that the communists in Moscow needed to organize for the long haul. They certainly did not give up on worldwide revolution, but saw it as more distant. They would need to rebuild and wait. So instead of presiding over the withering away of the state, they instead founded a new one, the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. It was founded on December 30th, 1922. It was an unprecedented experiment in politics and would last 69 years until 1991. Even with hopes deferred, Lenin and the communists prioritized useful expedients that seemed worth trying for the sake of survival. Thus, in international politics, they followed a double-track approach, seeking to subvert capitalist countries while also negotiating and trading at the same time. In 1921, Britain signed a trade agreement with Soviet Russia, and more agreements with other countries and diplomatic recognition for the Soviet Union followed. But the strangest expedient was this. In 1923, Karl Radek tried to reach out to German nationalists and the murderous Freikorps, who had recently killed his comrade Rosa Luxemburg and so many other German communists. The common turn at this time wanted to encourage another revolution in Germany, which was reeling economically because of the Ruhr crisis, in which the French occupied Germany's industrial heartland to compel the payment of war reparations. The Comintern now sent Radek in as their expert on Germany. Radek tried to encourage working together with German nationalists to construct a new fusion, National Bolshevism. The idea was to unite these earlier foes, communists and nationalists. In June 1923, Radek gave a strange speech that praised a dead Freikorps fighter and associate of the new Nazi movement Leo Schlageter, who had been executed by the French. In the final analysis, not much came of this, and a communist uprising in Hamburg was crushed in three days. But think about what Roddick's venture says about the willingness to try anything to advance the larger cause. Is that matchless flexibility? Is it bottomless cynicism? One can only imagine how Rosa Luxemburg would have responded. Meanwhile, even as the new Soviet regime lived to fight another day, despite its deferred dreams of worldwide revolution, it set about building a new civilization within its state through social experiment, which we'll explore in our next lecture.